As you can see, the book that we have put together to mark this occasion and our theme, Slavery and Its Consequences, Racism, Inequality, and Exclusion in the USA. I'm just going to make an opening brief statement, and then I'm going to call on the managing editor of our volume, uh, Jody Henderson, and then we're going to call on one of our sophomore chapel assistants, Mr. Damari Craddock from Florida, and he's going to introduce our moderator. <laughs> I have a whole legal pad of things I could say, and I'm sure you're not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> But I might just, since my background is pastoral psychology and counseling, my PhD, I haven't heard anyone else say this. Freud's definition of paranoia is wrapped around three defense mechanisms. Denial, projection, and avoidance. And I think this is a perfect description of the activity that the so-called white Republican supremacists are engaged in. And they're using this against people who are non-whites. First, they are denying something that is true about themselves. And then they are projecting that denial onto someone else. And claiming that what they have projected is true. And then they are avoiding the people on whom they have made the projection. And they are convincing themselves that by avoiding the people on whom they have projected, they're convincing themselves that they have dealt with the problem that they created. It's as simple as that. You get that? So that's the basis of paranoia. The heart of paranoia is fear. Fear of something that is not true. A professor at Georgia State University, maybe you will help me remember his name, published a book titled slavery by another name. And he produced a documentary film to illustrate all of the history from the Emancipation Proclamation up until a few years ago. One of the things that he proves in the book, documents, is that legal slavery in this country did not end until 1932, even though Theodore Roosevelt tried very hard to legally end it. 
But when Jody Henderson got in touch with me and asked me would I be the guest editor for this volume, I had just seen a short time earlier, a few weeks earlier in the Atlanta Journal and Constitution, a documented story with a photograph of African Americans enslaved in southern Georgia. That is, they were working against their will without wages. Most people will be a little caught off guard when they see the title of the journal because we don't always associate slavery with modern times. But since that experience, other articles have appeared on people enslaved around the world and the number is huge. So in the title of our theme, Overcoming, no, what is it? A little louder, please. Saving democracy while thriving in the wake of cosmic trauma. Okay. I linked trauma with the effects of slavery, and I deliberately chose the adjective or modifier cosmic in order to loop into your understanding of how extensive trauma is by connecting it to all of the traumas, especially global warming, which I prefer to call global disaster. Okay. I'm trying to contribute to educating people to understanding the significance of individual choices and decisions. And that all of our behavior has consequences and that the white supremacist idea of total freedom, that's where they're coming from. They want total freedom so they can control the non-whites. They do not want the non-whites to have autonomy competency. That's an ethical term. If you are autonomous, you are independent of them. And if you're independent of them, you might be courageous enough and ethical enough to vote who they want in power out. Are you understanding? Okay. Then because you seem to be unanimously agreed on understanding, I'm going to put an ellipsis there, and you won't have me much longer. <laughs> Jody, come right on up. I want you to know that Jody is a wonderful person to work with. It's amazing that we got this out on the telephone and on Zoom. <laughs> so that should be an encouragement to you. We have in our audience Dr. Anthony Penn from Rice University who turns out volumes <laughs> just like it's term papers. <laughs> Thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, I just want to take a moment to thank Dean Carter. Um, without him, this, this book that you see in front of you would not be here. Um, it, it's just his generosity of spirit, his presence, and his constant teaching. So thank you so much, Dean Carter. We really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank um, our other editor, or our third editor, Dr. Tina Davis. Um, she came all the way from London to be with us this evening, so Dr. Davis. 
I'd like, I'd like to thank all of our contributors. We have several contributors, four over here and, and Dr. Kemp over here. So five of the wonderful um, contributions to the book, but we also have several other people here who contributed. Uh, Dr. Penn contributed a piece. Uh, Ron Thomas, are you here? Yeah. Ah, Ron Thomas contributed a piece. Um, Najee, ah, I'm sorry, Najee, please say your last name. I don't want to massacre it. Latayad. Yes. Najee Latayad, he contributed the photo essay that you'll see. Um, so we have some wonderful contributions, and I want to thank you all so much, and thank you all for being here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Damari Craddock. I am a sophomore religion and English double major and philosophy minor from Orange Park, Florida. And I serve as the scholarship and practical ministry chair here at Morehouse College under the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel Assistance Program. And this evening, I have the esteemed honor and privilege to introducing our moderator for this evening, Dr. Adrian Jones, who is an assistant professor at Morehouse College. And Dr. Jones holds a PhD in political science from the City University of New York Graduate Center and a JD from the University of California, Berkeley. Her research focuses on the history and politics of black Americans and on public policy issues related to the black experience. Her doctoral dissertation, The Voting Rights Act Under Siege, The Development of the Influence of Colorblind Conservatism on the Federal Government and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is currently being exerted for journal publication. Dr. Jones is an expert witness on issues of voter suppression and U.S. voting history and regularly speaks about voting rights and provides a unique perspective to discussions about the VRA, voting black politics, history, and public policy. Please, everyone, give it up for Dr. Adrian Jones. expected to introduce myself. <laughs> um, I'm sure everybody's seen the book, um, but I think it's important to take a look at it because, um, oh, you can't hear me? Can you hear me now? How about now? I think it's important to take a look at it, even just physically, because um, I think that the work that this volume does with the various authors on various topics um, on this, on the issue of the impact of slavery for us today um, is incredible, right? We're talking religion, music, community, sexuality, um, our interpretation of the religion and our experience. Um, I've been wrapped uh, looking at the different uh, articles here, also some discussions between uh, musicians and authors that I think we can all benefit from. And in terms of the Dean theme, which is saving democracy while thriving in the wake of cosmic trauma, as someone who is studying and thinking about voting, voter access, voter suppression, and the things that emerge when people are able to participate in their governance, um, I think that I'm thinking constantly about whether or not the democracy can be saved. And even if for <laughs> this current period we end up actually losing the democracy, I think that this evening we will hear some um, good threads and ideas about how it is that we might go about saving the democracy for ourselves. Um, so I'm going to introduce the panelists who are here. And I'm gonna ask them, because none of you have read the material before, to speak for about five to seven minutes each about their articles. And then I'd like to pose some overriding questions. Um, I have five, and each of my questions is tied to a particular um, author's piece, but I think can be responded to by our panelists based upon the piece that they have contributed uh, to slavery and its consequences. So um, first, we have Dr. Joel B. Kemp, 
and his contribution in this compendium of writing is racializing Cain, demonizing blackness, and legalizing discrimination, proposal for a reception of Cain and America's racial caste system. Dr. Kemp, um, as a person in the world, has been a youth minister and uh, mentor for teenagers and young adults in the Boston and Cambridge area. He is an attorney who has uh, served at a firm and as general counsel for a consulting company. Right now, Dr. Kemp is an assistant professor of Hebrew Bible at Emory University's Candler School of Theology. He holds a PhD in Hebrew Bible from Boston College, a Master's in Divinity from Andover, and a JD from Harvard Law School. Um, he also attended and earned his AB from Harvard College. <clears throat> his first monograph is Ezekiel Law and Judaite Identity, a case for identity in Ezekiel 1 through 33. And I'm gonna keep the bio slightly short. These are extremely accomplished writers in particular, um, and they are uh, exemplary in their fields, have lots of awards. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a little snippet so that you can um, know who they are this evening. We can get to hearing about each of the articles, and then perhaps you can look at their longer bios. Um, we wanna also welcome Pro Associate Provost uh, Leah Creke. She is um, here at Morehouse College, originally in the English department. Um, she formerly taught at Spelman College and um, has graced this campus by serving in a number of positions, including chair of the English department and um, director of the Morehouse College Howard Thurman Honors Program. Um, in 2022, she was appointed to the provost's office, so she is now the associate provost of pedagogy and assessment here at Morehouse. Um, she's a English teacher, an educator, a cultural historian, and civic organizer. She's a graduate of Wesley College, where she earned her bachelor's degree in black studies. She, earned, she holds an MBA um, from Clark Atlanta University, and she has an interdisciplinary doctorate in philosophy um, in comparative literature from Emory University. Also, we have Dr. Orville Vernon Burton. His piece, um, did I tell you that Dr. Creke's piece, I don't have the title here, I apologize, but she does a very nice survey of literature between 2019 and 2022 about um, the importance of black lives. Um, Dr. Burton does <laughs> um, American slavery historiography, which is the bibliography of slavery that I needed in my first year of graduate school, <laughs> okay? Um, he is the inaugural Judge Matthew J. Perry Distinguished Chair of History and Professor of Pan-African Studies, Sociology and Anthropology and Computer Science at Clemson University. I'm sorry, I am very hot. Um, among his many accolades, he was the founding director of the Institute for Computing in Humanities, Arts, and Social Science at the University of Illinois, where he is Emeritus University Distinguished Teacher Scholar and Professor of History, African American Studies, and Sociology. In 2022, Dr. Burton was inducted into the South Carolina African American Heritage Commission and the Martin Luther King Jr. Colloquium of Scholars right here at Morehouse College. Dr. Burton. We also have Dr. Lewis Baldwin, and his piece in this compendium is A Home in Dat Rock, a From African Folk Sources and Slave Visions of Heaven and Hell, an excellent piece on the interpretation by blacks <laughs> of Christianity and, and its uh, variants from uh, white supremacist Christianity, um, which everyone should take a look at. Um, he has a bachelor's degree from Talladega College in history. He has um, a master's degree in black church studies and a master's of divinity and theology from Colgate Rochester in New York. And he has a PhD in American Christianity from Northwestern. He's an ordained Baptist minister, 
and the author of some 60 books and articles, or 60 articles and a number of books, um, <laughs> among which are Invisible Strands in African Methodism, A History of the African Union Methodist Protestant and Union American <laughs> Methodist Episcopal Churches between 1805 and 1980. And finally, um, Do Reverend Dr. Brandon Thomas Crowley is with us. His article is Modern Slavery by Another Name, A Black Church Response to Gender-Based Violence and the Human Trafficking of Black Women, Girls, Queer Folks for the Purpose of Sexual Exploitation. Um, all of us need to take a look at this <laughs> um, because it does an excellent job of talking about um, being female in the church, being LGBTQ in the church and the relationship of our black Christianity to um, those of us who are not men. Um, thank you, I just need to slow down a bit. Reverend Dr. Thomas Crowley is a pastor, preacher, author, and scholar in African American church studies and black theology. Since 2009, he has served as the senior pastor of the historic Myrtle Baptist Church in West Newton, Massachusetts, which is one of America's oldest black congregations founded by freed slaves at the end of Reconstruction and one of the few open and affirming historically black churches in North America. Presently, Reverend Dr. Crowley is a lecturer in ministry studies at Harvard University's Divinity School, which is of course in Massachusetts, he earned his PhD in church and society and a master of sacred theology with a certificate in social justice from Boston University School of Theology. He has a master's of divinity degree from Harvard University's Divinity School and a bachelor of arts in religion and certificate in moral cosmopolitanism and pastoral leadership from Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I would like to welcome the speakers. Um, I will invite Dr. Kemp to go first and speak for five to seven minutes about his article. Perhaps if you have your book, you might take a, a thumb through it and um, open to the article that is being discussed. And then I will offer some questions for all of the panelists to answer and give some few audience members an opportunity also to ask some questions. Yes? Good evening, everyone. I will avoid the Baptist tendency to spend the next five minutes saying thank you. Um, but I do want to offer my, <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, but I do want to offer my sincere thank you to Dean Carter and all those who helped put this volume together and extended the gracious invitation to me. Uh, I'm looking forward to our discussion today and hearing from the panelists. I often tell students the the greatest hustle about the academy is that we are paid students. Everywhere we go, we get to learn. So I'm as excited to learn as I am to share. Um, so now my five minutes starts. <laughs> in, in thinking about uh, this question, it's hard for me to think about the place of African Americans or those of us who are racialized black without thinking about two realities. The first is the role of the Bible. The second is the rule of law. So again, the role of the Bible and the rule of law. What I offer in the edited volume is that these two ideas of scriptural interpretation and legal development create a kind of vice grip or a bear trap that marks black folk and targets us for particular kinds of violence and persecution. In the article, I talk about blackness in 3D. The three Ds, building off of something that Dean Carter mentioned, I argue is a kind of projection of what blackness means. That they have misused the biblical record to argue that as black people, we are fundamentally dangerous, fundamentally deviant, and irredeemably depraved. Again, so that we are dangerous, we are depraved, and we are deviant. To make the case 
for those three Ds in, in the article that is before you. I focused on one example from the primeval history, or Genesis chapters 1 through 11. And I focus in this article and in the larger book project on the primeval history as a way of arguing that in America's racialization, they want to argue that race is not a construct, but a divine creation. So by saying that before history as we know it begins, God designated certain people as black and then mark their blackness as a sign of dangerousness, deviance, and depravity, you then have theological warrant to treat us as other. So I use the mark of Cain in Genesis 4 to argue as an example of that racialization. The five-second punchline of what I try to argue in terms of the history of interpretation is that the mark of Cain in Genesis 4 is used as a sign of protection. Cain tells God, look, your punishment is too severe. When you throw me out, they will kill me. And God says, you're right. So I give you an oath, the Hebrew word for sign, that marks you. Through a long tradition in Jewish and particularly in Christian traditions, that mark of Cain, which was a mark of protection in the biblical record, becomes a divine sentence, a mark of divine judgment of what I call the three Ds. The second part of my article, which and relates to the second piece I talked about with the rule of law. As I look at the ways in which these three Ds, again, dangerousness, depravity, deviance, gets codified in American law. In particular, I look at antebellum slave codes. And if you read those codes carefully, you'll see that these ideas of dangerousness or depravity saturate the justification for regulating black bodies, for protecting citizens from those people. And I won't regale you with the offensive language, you can read that at your leisure, um, and depending upon your religious tradition with much prayer or a good bourbon, whatever works best for you. Um, and they argue that this is just who you are and what it means to be black. And as a result of what that means to be black, the rule of law allows violent regulation of that. To bring that into the modern context, I focus on just two, two examples of that. Um, without dating myself too much, I was a teenager during the Rodney King incident. And as I began looking more into that, I was struck by some striking similarities between that and Michael Brown, who's often considered one of the touchstones for the current Black Lives Matter movements. And in both of those incidents, the arresting officer and the officers who led the assault or the murder, in the case of Brown, describe both of those black men as devils as demons, as monsters. So I asked the question, how can two men, 20 years apart, separated by 2,000 miles, look at a black man and say, that's a demon? One argument that I make is that it's the effect of this racialization and its codification in law. And finally, the, the Baptist ministry, we can't end there. I have to give you a little bit of hope. So what do we do with this? Uh, my wife, who's a clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Mercer, we've been working together over the last two years to think about a way of changing qualified immunity and arguing that when they use the reasonable person standard in law, the reasonable person standard is a lie because it doesn't take into account the effects of racism on a person's reason. So what we are arguing and advocating for is that rather than having qualified immunity on the basis of a reasonable person test, that there needs to be a heightened degree of scrutiny applied to any time violence or lethal force is used against a black body. Because history tells us you cannot be reasonable when you are racist. And that's what we're advocating for. I believe I did that in four minutes and 38 seconds. So thank you for your time. <laughs> Dr. Pique. Well, good evening, good evening, Dean Carter. I want to thank you, as always, for uplifting our scholarship here at Morehouse and allowing me the opportunity to share my uh, work as an English professor, not something I often have time to do. 
and Jody Henderson. It was a pleasure working with you as well. And to all of my other panelists, uh, other contributors. I have so many students in this room, former <laughs> students and good friends. Um, it is a pleasure to be here on this auspicious occasion. Uh, as Adrian mentioned, uh, I am a professor of English. And um, my name is not phonetic at all, though, so I tend to defy a lot of English conventions. My name is Leah, not Leah. Leah Crique. It's not phonetic at all um, because there's a lot of patois in my name. What I decided to write about, and here again I went back into the vernacular. Oh dear, an English professor using the vernacular. Uh, I called my article Literary Review of the Woke. 2019 to 2021. And of course, I felt a little bad about using that term woke. I mean, I know it's au courant. It's the vernacular. Uh, but I, I really was um, moved by the movement that was apparent that most of our students took part in in the midst of the pandemic in response to all of the atrocities, uh, in particular against black men and black women, such as Breonna Taylor, um, by the justice system, and how that movement was worldwide and global. And so uh, it homage to them. They walked around saying, you know, you're not woke, or we want you to be woke, and they kept talking about woke, and I said, okay, I'm going to not be persnickety about the, ver <laughs> the English composition and take off points like I do. And I'm going to use that term woke. <laughs> and I also, you know, I, look, I said, these are our children. You know, they didn't come, they came from our tradition. And I kept saying, where did they come from with this woke? And then I thought about my grandmother. When I was a little girl, you know, uh, we were, um, very much involved in the civil rights movement, particularly at my church. My grandfather was a minister of the CME church. So you know, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, so you know we were in the midst of the civil rights movement. And there was a song they used to sing, woke up this morning with my mind, set on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind, set own freedom. Anyway, we could keep going and sing all night. But there was that woke. I was like, oh my God. We were woke. <laughs> my grandmother would die if I used that language woke in a literary piece. She would have a fit. But there it was. There was that woke. So that's why I used that. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. Uh, they're sampling our spirituals like they sample things in the hip hop music and um, come up with something that's, that's real. But the other thing that I thought about, because I am in um, English literature, was that there is a, move, a literary movement that has not yet been named. And I haven't come up with it, maybe all of these great ministers in the room and, PhDs in the room can help. But anyway, you know, there was the literary movement. We are, we're familiar with the, you know, the slave narrative era, you know, the abolitionist literature. We're familiar with uh, the Harlem Renaissance and the black nationalist slash black cultural movement. It has a name. And all of the literature of that era, you know, reflects the perspectives of what we were going through. Um, in our African-American journey. And so I'm here looking at 2019 to 2021, and there's a literary movement that has very set characteristics by which we could, in fact, frame and name it. I have not yet done so. And a lot of times, it's always way after when these things are named. So. 
I guess I shouldn't feel too bad that I can't give it a name. But anyway, I kind of, in so doing, I went through all of the literature that came out during this period. And it's interesting to note, and I really wish that I could read this, because I will ramble if I don't. But I'm not going to read it. I was told not to read. But if you look at, let me turn this page so I don't say it incorrectly. But if you look at the fact that the de historical marker of our quote unquote arrival into America as slaves, 1619. I know that some say it was 1520s or whatever, but you know, we generally say it's 1619. Occurred in 2019. Our tw that was the, you know, the anniversary. And look at the literature that came out from 2019 to 2021 and all of the unrest in the midst of the pandemic. I mean, it was like, clearly something was afoot. For example, if you just look at the book 1619, which was quite controversial, you know, well, first it was the New York Times Magazine um, article, and what was posited there was that the, that the slave community built America, that this democracy that we decry is something that we fight for all over the world. So that was, you know, black people really <coughs> carved out what is American democracy. We made what is American democracy. And then right on cue, after the horrible, brutal murder of George Floyd, May 2020, almost on cue was the publication of Isabel Wilkerson's work cast the origins of our discontent that came out in August of 2022 I'm sorry August of 2020 and so then you've got our elections coming the hotly contested gubernatorial race with Stacey Abrams who is an author I know you know that um, but she's a published author and though she, a lot of her work is in romance, she came out with some one on leadership, Our Time Is Now, Power, Purpose, and the Fight for Fair America. But the one that I love, and it was a page turner, if you haven't read it, you must, While Justice Sleeps. That book, oh my God. Stacey Abrams, While Justice Sleeps, you must read it. And no sooner did that come out then we, have, then we had the insurrection, January 6th. And I looked at the work that our alum, uh, Bakari Sellers, wrote, My Vanishing Country, uh, a long time coming, reckoning with race in America. So Biden got to the inaugural stand, and who was there? but Amanda Gorman, one of the greatest poets. And her work, um, The Hill We Climb. And then the next one, Call Us What We Carry. Okay, because we are identified by this journey and what we've carried into this journey. And, on, and, and at almost simultaneous is one of my favorites, um, by historian, and I, I hope I'm not miss. it's Tia or Taya, I say Tia Miles. And her work is all that she carried, the journey of Ashley Sack, uh, in which a black slave uh, woman uh, made, made a sack for her daughter as she, the daughter was being sold away from her. And for generations up until the time in which our National uh, African American Museum, the Smithsonian, was dedicated. Each generation had passed that sack down and it ended up in, this, in the museum. So we're talking about what we carry. It's in the works of Amanda Gorman, it's in the works of 
historian Taya Miles, and others. So clearly, if we really look at all of this, um, the love songs of W.B. Du Bois, I mean, we hearken back, talk about what we carry. Look at Honoré Jeffers. That book is like a, an epic. I consider it as much of an epic as the Iliad and the Odyssey. And she, the thread throughout her work, which is a long odyssey of, of, a, of a black family in the South, is the thought of our intellectual leader, W.B. Du Bois. So there's something going on here. It's too early to name, but I just thought I would take some time to look at all of the literature that came out during these past three years of our pandemic. Um, the pandemic of racism and the pandemic of whatever uh, communicable disease is rampant and to see if there were some literary markers that we might take pause and, and, and interpret what does this all mean. Thank you. Dr. Baldwin. First, I want to say good evening to everyone. I want to express my most heartfelt gratitude to Jody Henderson. Is she here? Jody Henderson and Dean Carter for making this special issue of the Journal of Modern Slavery possible. A way to thanks also to the participants on this book launch panel for your contribution to this project. I had prepared a 15 minute talk, <laughs> but I was told when I got here that I should talk only five minutes. So uh, the title of my piece in the volume was taken from a slave spiritual entitled I Got a Home in That Rock, a spiritual which was repopularized after slavery and the Civil War by the Fisk Jubilee singers, Paul Robeson and others. So again, the title of my piece, A Home in That Rock, Afro-American Folk Sources and Slave Visions of Heaven and Hell. I set out to establish three main points in my article. First, that slaves were thinkers. They were thinkers. It is very important to keep this in mind because the dominant image and often the only image we get of the slaves in most of the scholarship on slavery is that of laborers who were brutally and unjustly exploited. And indeed they were. But we don't typically think of slaves as people who could think. And I wanted to make it clear that slaves were thinkers who expressed their thoughts, their values, their creative ideals through the prism of not only songs, but also folk tales, aphorisms, anecdotes, proverbs, and other oral sources, which according to historian Lars Levine, constituted what we call orally transmitted expressive culture. And the second point I set out to establish in my article is that slave religion must be understood in terms of the interrelationship between this worldly and otherworldly concerns. In other, world, in other words, the religion of the slaves 
was not, as the black sociologist E. Franklin Frazier contends, essentially otherworldly in outlook. Clearly, the interrelationship between this worldly and otherworldly concerns is a finds powerful expression, not only in the lyrics of the slave spirituals, but also in sermons, folk tales, and other, sermon, other sources. When I get to heaven, I'm going to be at ease. Me and my God going to do as we please. Going to chatter with the Father, argue with the Son. Tell him about the world I just come from. And we might quote another spiritual that reflects a dislike for the pain of bondage and are looking forward to the joys of heaven. Got hard trials on this earth. Heaven is my home. Clearly, the historian Sterling Stuckey is right when he says that even when released from the burdens of this world, Slaves would keep alive memories of their oppression. Tell them about the world I just come from. And there's another third point that I tried to get across in my article. Although slave religion was influenced to some degree by missionary association, and the slaves' exposure to Euro-American Christianity, African slaves shaped a different set of values than their white oppressors where heaven and hell were concerned. In other words, slaves' sources show that slaves did not subscribe to the slave master's vision of a heaven where white supremacy slavery and segregation would persist, and of a hell where disobedient and rebellion slaves would suffer eternal damnation. Slaves typically associated heaven with freedom. Visions of freedom in heaven are prominently revealed in countless slave songs, sermons, and tales. My own research shows that there were a number of contexts in which slaves were more apt to think of heaven while standing at the auction block where family members were sold and separated from relatives, friends, and loved ones, which explains why unending reunions in heaven are a prominent theme in slave tales, sermons, and songs. Interestingly enough, among first and second generation African slaves, many believed that when they died, they would return to Africa and be reunited with family and friends there. Now white masters, white slave masters also spoke of reunions in heaven in their songs and sermons. But they did not have to deal with family separations. So visions of reunion in heaven were not the same for slaves and slave owners, or blacks and whites for that matter. Slaves were also most likely to think of heaven at grave sites as the bodies of family members and friends were interred or laid to rest. And also on Sundays, when slaves had the day off and were allowed to rest, to visit with each other, to share their pain with each other, and to sit around and chat and sometimes worship with friends and neighbors. This is why slaves often sang spirituals like by and by, by and by, good Lord, by and by, every day will be Sunday, by and by. Sunday meant not only freedom, it meant rest. Rest from the plantation system 
of forced unpaid labor. It meant reunions. It meant the restoration of community. It meant peace. Here heaven was defined as the very antithesis of slavery. Now I've said that masters taught their slaves or tried to teach their slaves that hell was an eternal depository for disobedient and rebellious slaves. Those slaves who ran away, uh, who stole their masters hogs and chickens or who planned revolts. For the slaves, hell was an ex eternal repository for white folks, and especially slave masters. The historian Thomas L. Weber writes, and I quote him, slaves had little interest in hell except as an eternal depository for slaveholders, end quote. A correspondent for the Southern Workman reported in 1897 that some ex-slaves were even convinced that no white people went to heaven. Heaven, they reasoned, was only for ex-slaves because they had already had their hell down here. The ex-slave Levi Coppin recounted an aphorism often repeated by fellow slaves when whites were seen dressed in expensive clothes and riding in fine carriages. Quote, that is all the hell you will ever get, all the heaven you will ever get. Oh, heaven, heaven, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there, the slaves sang with one eye on the big house where Massa lives. Only in rare cases did slaves think of hell as a place where fellow slaves would be infinitely tortured. They did make exception in the case of slaves who were traitors or who collaborated with slave owners in the subjugation of their people those who betrayed the confidence of fellow slaves. As one ex-slave put it, such slaves were, quote, the same as white people, end quote. Let me conclude by referring to a wonder, wonderful slave tale from the collection of Edward C.L. Adams. Adams was a white physician who treated ex-slaves in the late 19th century, and he collected, recorded, and, pu and published many of the slave tales that were told to him. And in one of those tales called The King Buzzard, that tale was apparently shared among the Gullah in the Georgia, South Carolina seacoast areas. Uh, in that particular tale, a chief, an African chief, uh, collaborates with slave traders in capturing and enslaving his people. And when that chief died, of course, his spirit wandered eternally because he could not find a place in heaven and he was not desired in hell. So you can understand this image of endless wanderings, restlessness, the spirit of an African chief that could not find rest because he collaborated with slave traders against his own people. I'll stop there. And Dr. Burton. Thank you so much, all of you who made this possible. Morehouse is truly sacred ground, a sacred place. I am so honored to be here, and we can thank everyone, but I do want to say 
Thank you to the visionary and prophetic Dean Carter uh, as he continues to guide us in those ways. Well, I, I was very interested because I don't think I had seen the title uh, of the book, but it's called Slavery's Consequences, Racism, uh, and then the rest of it, inequity and exclusion in the United States. Because I wrestled with the same thing in uh, the penultimate book I just did, uh, Justice Deferred. There's an irony that we are, time me on this, okay, because this is, okay. Uh, there is an, uh, there's an irony because everyone knows there's no such thing as race, but there's something called racism. You know, historians call it a social construct. There's no gene or anything, you know, gen uh, genetics that identifies race, or you can take it as I do as a person of faith that all of us, all people are created in God's image, but, but yet we have racism. And this goes back to Professor Kemp's, Dr. Kemp's uh, talking about law and order's race, because what we discover is that American law, not in 1619, but later, begins to define this social construct as a legal concept, race. And that has been used for how long to discriminate against a group of people, which we think of as race. So I have the same guilt that, you know, justice for race and the Supreme Court, which is no such thing, but what we look at, particularly if you want to follow up on what uh, Dr. Kemp said, is that at least for 10 generations, 12 generations, it's only been the last two generations, the laws discriminated against and taught white privilege, taught white superiority to people through the law. So when we get discouraged, you want to not be discouraged, we think about as bad as things are looking now, we've had all these generations, and really only about two generations of trying to move away from it is one thing. Uh, my book is, a, my essay, excuse me, is on uh, the historiography of slavery. Now, most of you know that historiography is just a history of what historians have said. Uh, most people get their jollies and happiness and all of this from religion or from maybe drugs or alcohol. Historians get it by arguing with each other about interpretations. <laughs> so I won't go on to that just to say that the last 10 years among historians, the emphasis has been on the centrality of slavery to the United States. And we're still playing that on out. Maybe we can talk about it in question. But I want to throw something that I brought up in this essay, which is very long. I looked at it 50 or 60 pages, uh, uh, but I think we try to cover the slavery there, it was a conundrum that I dealt with in graduate school was presented to me when I first went to Princeton for the PhD in 1969, right out of the Army. And it was the question of which came first. Was it slavery by putting people into a denigrated position that made people turn racist or racism develop, or was it because there was this automatic view of when people, that is Europeans, encountered Africans that they thought of them as different and enslaved them? And that becomes an important question. I deal with this a little bit. It's not the historic of slavery in the essay because it matters politically. Lyndon Johnson with the Great Society believed sincerely that it was a degraded position that had led people to then white people have racist views and it was sort of a happy view that he had that you could then by taking people out of that degraded position, giving them the fair opportunities and things that that racism would disappear. Now, the Problem is, we never got rid of that, as we've talked about, the continuation of slavery, the judicial system, all of that is still there. 
I talk about the 13th Amendment has gotten sort of a bad rap because it was interpreted to say that one of the things it does is get rid of the badges of slavery. But those badges of slavery are here, whether it's in voting and attached on the Voting Rights Act. If you go to McDonald's and you see a white person who is sitting uh, doing the cash register, and you see a person of color flipping the burgers back there. All of that is related, I think, to this book we're talking about and the essay that I've got. How much time do I have? I'll just make a couple of quick points. You have time. You sure? I, I don't want to, I want to have. Uh, one of the things I want to point out, I put out in the book, is a lot of people don't realize why it took so long to get this history of slavery and understanding it uh, where we are now and going. Archives, particularly those in the former Confederacy and those states that enslaved people, weren't interested in the history of African Americans at all. So the early interpretations of enslaved people came from the records of plantations that white people had put down. And this gets even more so when you think about this. I wrote a book on Penn Center, Penn Center uh, a History Preserved, another sacred place along with me, like Morehouse, a very sacred place where Martin Luther King planned so many of his um, uh, of his campaigns where Andrew Young ran, in fact, the citizenship schools. But when they gave, they offered their papers, University of South Carolina, 1963, after integration, they had one stipulation that everybody should have access to those papers. University of South Carolina refused to take them because they did not want black people coming into the, there are places in the former Confederacy, in the 1970s and mid 1970s, for African Americans were actually welcomed into the archives. And so we live in an era where people think that, uh, you know, you can just create facts, alternative facts. That's, you have to have evidence, and evidence is important. And that's why we need this historiography and other interpretations that I think is so important. Um, I do think that we're going to see a lot more work, and I sort of hint at this at the end of the essay, on the aftermath of slavery. You know, we, we, it's interesting because Americans focus on the Civil War. They think if there's an identity in America, it is in the Civil War. And that makes some sense. You know, more people were killed in that war, but you also were dealing with the issue that we might call multiculturalism today. What is the place of a group of people who are seen as different than what was at that time the majority or as what we would think of as other? But I really think that the identity of America, if it's not there, what we became at least was hammered out in reconstruction, which is so has to be tied into our understanding of slavery. It was the most progressive period in American history as opposed to the mythology that the textbooks had even fairly recently when I've testified in court literally in the 1990s, not just in the South, but in California, heard defendants, uh, the, the county defendants against the minority plaintiffs mentioned the horrors and tragedy of reconstruction about voting. It's completely false. And then the other side of it is what we see today among a group of politicians. They are masters with the language. What did they call the overthrow of the most progressive period of history? What terminology did they use? They called it redemption. Now, I grew up Baptist, and redemption is a wonderful word, but they are talking about a coup d'etat, an overthrow of a legitimately elected interracial government that was doing more good for people than had ever been done in the former Confederacy, and we call it redemption. There's a lot more to be done to tie it together and with slavery too. I can stop there or keep going forever, but as I said, it's 60 pages, and I don't know if you want to see what this historian said and that historian said or not, but uh, I, I hope you will read it or at least skim it and get some ideas about how historians come to their conclusion. Is there truth or isn't there truth? There is evidence despite 
the I and where that evidence is and how you get it so important. And despite what people tell you about alternative facts, it is important today more than ever that we adhere to evidence. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Crowley. Good evening, Dean Carter. Thank you for this opportunity, Quincy. I am honored to be a part of this panel. Um, I was laughing because as I was getting ready to go up, uh, Dr. Baldwin's uh, wife asked me, she said, are you a student? And you look 20, you look so young. <laughs> so I am very honored to be a part of this uh, discussion this evening with one of my former professors. In America, black women, transgender, intersex, queer, and gender non-conforming survivors of gender-based violence and human trafficking face unprecedented levels of discrimination, harassment, health disparities, poverty, and exclusion in virtually every institution and setting, including black churches. Gender-based violence is a systemic sin that black churches should feel compelled to recognize, to confront, and to subvert because African-American Christianity and black churches bear its stain. Sadly, despite this stark reality, many black churches struggle with having conversations about gender-based violence and human trafficking because of their preoccupation with the toxicity of American puritanical Christianity. The American ideal of puritanicalism has seeped its way into the black American religious landscape and it has nearly destroyed what I'd like, uh, leaning on Dr. Peter Paris's work, the pre-reconstruction idea of black churches as inclusive spiritual citadels for battered and sexually violated black bodies. The most current form of puritanicalism is best seen in what we now know as white Christian nationalism. Protestant puritanism privileges the white male stereotype as normative, while utilizing oppressive metaphors to create unsafe Christian spaces for othered bodies. In other words, the white middle class American puritanical society has woven itself into the tapestry of American Christianity. Puritanicalism has become an inescapable cesspool of oppression where, the hu where human trafficking of black bodies and acts of gender-based violence against black bodies thrive with great fervor. Gender-based violence is categorized as any form of physical, sexual, psychological, emotional, or personal harm inflicted on a person uh, sexual or physical assault, murder, rape, uh, sexual harassment, bullying, uh, verbal abuse, persuasion, stalking, intimate relationship violence that includes employment, housing, or educational intimidation or obstruction, elder abuse, something we do not talk enough about, and child abuse, sex-specific torture, female genital mutilation, early or forced marriage, sex tourism, major issue in Atlanta, forced prostitution, human trafficking for sex, or forced, or something that is fairly new now, revenge pornography, to name a few. Countless black women, black girls, black boys, and black queer and trans folk experience gender-based violence not outside of, but in black churches at the hands of empowered male clergy persons, church leaders, and even family members. And for centuries, the black church or black churches have covered this up with the violence of silence. Some black churches believe that gender-based violence doesn't happen here. It's, it's not a problem in our church. And all of these assumptions are drenched in the notion that denial is a valid solution. The violence of silence looks like quietly dismissing offenders while without alerting the proper authorities to avoid a scandal and sweeping it under the rug without providing faith-specific intervention 
or future training for leaders about ministry and pastoral care needs of survivors of sexual violence. And uh, the, the violence of silence also looks like not believing survivors. So for this reason, black churches are often roadblocks for those who wish to heal from gender-based violence. Some of these obstructions include the obsession that some black churches have with certain theologies of the cross that prioritize belief about long suffering and forgiveness as Christian mandates, which inadvertently encourages abused persons to remain in abusive relationships and obliges survivors to forgive their abusers. Black pastors and their, chur their churches should never use scriptures or personal theological premises to encourage survivors to remain with their abusers. In the article that I wrote for this book, I attempted to provide a theoretical and practical method for subverting the systems that uphold gender-based violence in black churches. As a queer theorist and queer theologian, I am um, trying to turn from our obsession with just repetitively going over and over the problem without constructing solutions and ways forward with hope. The theoretical method that I describe is a form of queering, specifically for the black church, which I sort of tickle a bit in this article and work out more in my book called Black Ecclesial Queering. Black ecclesial queering is a subversive methodology that centers on education, prevention, intervention, and healing from gender-based violence and human trafficking. The education portion centers on knowing the history of gender-based violence in your context, having conversations, and feeding your mind with the appropriate resources. I'm a curriculum developer with the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, so that's one resource that I would recommend using. My preventative measures look like working to change attitudes or questioning gender roles and stereotypes that make gender-based violence acceptable in society and within our black churches. But the more practical aspect of this model of black ecclesial queering is threefold. It includes lament, repentance, and the creation of sanctuary. Lament means making spaces for stories and providing an avenue for naming and processing individual and communal violence, grief, and pain. The repentance part, this is where it gets a little tricky, is an act of humility where churches repent and apologize for their complicity in the systems of sexual and gender-based violence. But lip service isn't enough. The enactment of that repentance is what I call the sort of creation of sanctuary. This is a very important phrase. This is the phase uh, that begins with black churches learning how to do no harm. Um, by this I mean that black churches must begin to profile leaders by checking for criminal histories and training their leaders about sexual aggression and gender-based violence and uh, transgender violence. Uh, the, um, the, 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 the lack of centrality or the lack of denominational connection amongst Baptist churches, according to some of the data that I've been dealing with, proves that Baptist churches become prime spaces for predators because there is no reporting mechanism and a person can simply go to another Baptist church in another place and because the performer Baptist church wants to sweep it under the rug so that they don't get bad publicity, people perhaps are bringing sex offenders on as Sunday school teachers and youth leaders. The next thing, um, I'm moving quickly, the next thing that churches should also do is have well-written and well-known, those are two different things, <laughs> well-written and well-known policies about matters of gender-based violence and sexual harassment. How are you going to handle these issues so that it's consistent across the board? What is the reporting mechanism? And um, however, the biggest blockade that I've discovered to these policies existing in black churches on gender-based violence and human and sexual harassment would be the issue that our traditional system of hierarchies in black churches, um, uh, where are places where men and women cannot exercise equal roles of power. 
So men are placed in positions of authority and the decision making is made by men who are trying to protect their friends who have been the male aggressors against persons in the congregation. And then lastly, the intervention and healing phase, I suggest that churches should not try to recreate the will because they will fail miserably, but that intervention and healing from gender-based violence and human trafficking um, is best done by black churches developing social partnerships with their local health departments, with women's clinics, with mental health resources and methadone clinics to offer gender-based violence survivors with wraparound services um, and full support for not just parents or adults, but children as well, and those who are in need of health care. I'll stop there. Thank you. There's a lot here. Um, so I'm, my intention is to ask some questions, or a question. I don't know um, how much time we have left. Um, and to ask those of you on the panel how what you are investigating informs uh, the bigger question. And so I want to start with the fact that I think that we are in a very critical historical moment where um, politicization is making it difficult for us to maintain the civil rights and civil liberties that I think um, particularly many of our young people think are standard um, and might not actually disappear. But, you know, um, Roe versus Wade has been turned over, the Voting Rights Act, and um, state legislative independent doctrine. I don't want to go into a large explanation of that. However, um, these are issues that are going to result in um, a Jim Crow-esque, a slavery-esque posture where states are able to discriminate against us as black and brown people and women and LGBTQ folks. Um, and so I want to know, you were talking, for example, about qualified immunity, perhaps a new reasonableness measure. Um, Dr. Crowley, you're talking about our relationship to each other um, and the fairness that, need, the expansion of fairness that needs to happen there and good treatment. Um, you've looked at this literature um, over the last couple of years about Black Lives Mattering. Uh, we're thinking about our interpretation of slavery and how it impacts today. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, how do we interpret, you know, can we bring that liberation idea in terms of our theology to this current moment? And so I'm wondering if you have anything to say about what you've written here um, in terms of its application to this phase that we're about to enter, where I believe that our students who are graduating here from Morehouse College will be using those ideas to engage um, in putting us back. You know, I'm under the impression that we are entering a third reconstruction, essentially, right? We have two times had to build civil rights and civil liberties. It's time to do it again. Um, and so how are the essays that you've written in this uh, manual or in this uh, compendium, how will they have an e effect on this modern development? Do we have microphones on the tables? Why don't you start us off? Um, because you have those ideas about what qualified immunity looks like now and how it might be adjusted um, so that we are all thinking about responsibility for black people and not ignoring it by making it the standard procedure? Yeah, the short answer. Oh, I'm sorry, there are uh, microphones on the other table. I guess I, you don't mind me standing next to you? No, I certainly don't. <laughs> um, <coughs> the short answer for me, and I shared this with a few of the Morehouse brothers earlier, 
for me, there's a connection between bad politics and bad theology. And so, similar to what uh, Dr. Crowley was mentioning in terms of how do you get rid of certain, what he identified as toxic misinterpretations of our Christology. I think the, one of the ways we can do this practically is think about, in my case, the racialized implications of your theology, whatever that is. And if you think about the racialized kind of application implications of your theology, then look at it in areas of passion of interest to you. I do it in law. I love literature, but have no expertise on what to do with it. <laughs> I just know I like it or I don't like it. Um, and so for me, I would, I would encourage all of us in those areas to think about how your theological ideas, even if you have abandoned all theological ideas and say there is no God, that still has an implication for how one thinks about the world as it's ordered. And so for me, that's where I would start. Um, in terms of the nitty gritty of the qualified immunity, it's taking this idea of reasonableness assumes the ability that one can think critically and think clearly, right? If you're a good reformed person like me, at least I was raised by that, then we believe in this concept of the total depravity of humankind, which doesn't mean that we are always evil, but it does mean that how we think, how we feel has been warped. It has been adversely affected by the world around us. And in our American context, I think racism is one of those sins that warps our perception. So it's a matter of both self-examination and then corporate action to recognize how that has shaped literally our laws and the ways in which we do things. That would be my short answer to that. Dr. Crowley, did you um, given some information about how you think churches should improve, um, but in the spirit of this question, um, how do we make the attitude shifts that would make those solutions obvious, such that we are not um, discriminating against our members based upon these uh, meta ideas that we have? So, you know, good systems are fantastic, but how are we moving towards not judging each other such that that hierarchy of abuse exists? Thank you. Um, so I want to go back to the discussion that I was trying to uh, explain around puritanicalism, uh, really focusing on James Baldwin's way of looking at it. Uh, one of my um, favorite works of queer theology was written by a, a heterosexual black male, E.L. Cornegue. He writes about um, rethinking black theology through the lens of James Baldwin. Um, and um, th the point I'm wanting to make when I read these two quotes is that for me, the puritanicalism that has slipped into the church is really about control because the nature of the sort of puritanical aspect was in the as of trying to control black bodies. Um, so I'm looking at this Protestant puritism as a sort of theo-historical dynamic that's rooted and grounded and racialized sexual oppression. And so I think the first thing that we need to do is to educate our churches on the type of theologies that we are accepting and bringing in and how that goes against, it's antithetical, to um, what the black church and black churches or the black ecclesial movement was meant to be. Um, and, 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 and the other quote I wanna share with you is directly from Baldwin. He says, it is important to remember what it means to be born in a Protestant Puritan country with all the taboos placed on the flesh and have at the same time in this country such a vivid example of a decent pagan imagination and the sexual liberty with which white people invest Negroes and then penalize them for. It's a guilt about the flesh in this country, the Negro pays for that guilt, which white people have about our flesh. So I see it as an element of control. And um, in the black church, it becomes trying to control black women's bodies and trying to utilize uh, the bodies of persons who may not be equipped with some element of power. Dr. Creekay, in the literature that you have surveyed, 
Um, do you see information about um, that we are going to use as we move forward in this observation of um, George Floyd's death and the subsequent protest? Certainly. As a matter of fact, I wanted to mention that really I think what fueled the protest were some works that came right before, like Just Mercy by Brian mm -hmm, Stevenson. Mm -hmm which became a movie. Uh, there are several works that, um, and, and Nicole Hannah-Jones, I mean, that just really, she kicked it off, okay? <laughs> I mean, and now it's CRT drama. I mean, there's a direct line. Oh, direct. <sighs> and, and I mean, and she really couched the framing of democracy with the black struggle. So she set that mm -hmm. frame mm -hmm. beautifully. And of course, as I mentioned, Isabel Wilkerson, um, her work was so comprehensive that it gave us the vocabulary yeah. to discuss this and all of her searing examples and manifestations of how uh, our, you know, we, we talk about being racist in America, but she names it, she nails it down to the root. It's a caste system. And so, yes, we are using that, definitely. Well, I'm conflicted. Dr. Baldwin, um, would you say that black people still maintain some of that interpretation of religion that slaves used in terms of thinking of it more as liberating? And how do you think that will um, come to bear as we move through this next phase in terms of trying to save our democracy? Well, I think we have to first look at the historiography of slavery. Uh, prior to 1959, the dominant view was that African slaves uh, embraced the thinking, the ideals, the traditions of their masters. And in 1959, of course, Stanley Elkins, who was a major historian of slavery, um, argued from the standpoint of personality, and his view was that the typical slave was reduced to a sambo, who uh, do a docile slave who accepted the values, traditions, and the thinking of his master. But since that time, scholars like Sterling Stuckey and Lawrence Levine and others have argued that the slave, the typical slave was not a sambo, that slaves had the space and the freedom to create, and that the songs and folk tales and sermons and other folk sources indicate that the slaves were creators of ideals, that they were thinkers. And I think that's very important. I think through Today, if you look at African Americans, we are, are not a part of what Kenneth Stamp would call a common culture with white people. We have different ideals, we have different values, and they are based largely on our experiences, our traditions. So I think that, um, that, 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 that we are a different kind of people. We, we have a different culture. And that culture is based largely on our capacity to be creators uh, in the areas of folklore and art and literature and other areas. So I think the argument that Sterling Stuckey and Lawrence Levine and other scholars put forth after 1959, challenging Stanley Elkins, is, is uh, quite legitimate, that we are people who are not carbon copies or pale facsimiles of white people. Uh, we are a people who have fashioned our own culture. We are a subculture in the larger American culture. And we have our own ideals, our own values, and our own worldview. And, and, and that, I think that's very important. And that's what I've tried to get across in, in my essay. Dr. Burton, do you want to um, speak to? Thank you. You know, one of the things that's happened the last 10 years I discussed in the essay is what's called intersectionality, and it speaks to 
all of this, but it started out with women writing about uh, the experience of black women, and particularly in this case, enslaved women was different than that necessarily of enslaved men. And now it goes into all sorts of gender differences, whether it's gay or lesbian or others in ways. So this intersectionality, and I would add to that class as well, uh, which isn't normally seen that way, but I think that's important. And I have a long discussion, if you're interested in it, in the essay. Uh, but I want to go back one more time uh, to Dr. Kemp and just say that while it's not in that essay, I would strove and dealt with the very issue you are about the policing and the reasonableness. And I'd add one other thing. You know, Booker T. Washington's had a hard uh, road in terms of how people looked at him compared to Du Bois, but in doing this book, we discover that all this time he's getting all these philanthropists from the North to uh, fund voting rights of all things, let alone debt peonage. But he also had a point that I've become to think may be more important than we realize, that the only color that really matters is green. And so I think one of the arguments I would say is not just the reasonableness that you know, has really been abused in all sorts of ways, but take away where local governments cannot be sued. And if they are sued, I really believe, and their insurance rates then go up, you'll see some reform coming. So I, th I don't disagree with you, I agree completely, but I also think that people need to pay for those mistakes. And while you may not be able to, you know, sue a local policeman or someone, you can sue that city or the town, or the police force, and then they're going to have to uh, deal with those issues in a way. So I do think that with evidence, the law is still important and over the Supreme Court, equal justice under the law, despite what some of the Supreme Court justices seem to be saying now, it still can resonate with evidence to make a difference and move us much more than in that arc once again toward justice has been pulled away. Thank you very much. Um, do we have some questions from the audience? We want to make sure that we um, have time if people, okay, let those ideas percolate. Um, I know that, uh, you know, we have experienced racism and the oppression of slavery of Jim Crow as a result of white supremacy, but I think it's also important, and I mean, we we're talking about this already, that, um, you know, we oppress one another. Um, and so, do you have thoughts and ideas about, um, you know, when I think about, for example, gender-based violence, right? It's like you're bringing the slavery home. Do you want slavery at your home, church, in your house? Um, and I, so, you know, can we talk a bit about that phenomenon, breaking out of it? Um, you know, it's not just democracy at large, it's democracy in our own community spaces, homes, and ideas. And I don't, Dr. Crique, would you like to start? Well, you know, I was thinking about um, the love song of W.B. Du Bois by Honoré Jeffers, um, because what's so beautiful about what she does is that she goes all the way back to um, the pre-slavery times, and she integrates Native American, uh, in other words, she, she does a lineage, I guess it's like an epic of all of, of women um, who, who really become known as African American women. But those, our lives are intertwined, as we all know now, with the Native American. You know, her ancestor actually, mm -hmm. uh, the, the main character has visions of this Native American woman who seems to guide her spiritually uh, in the midst of, of what she's going through. And um, in her time period, she's in college, let's say in the 80s. And this Native American, as it turns out, that is an ancestor of hers. And people forget that we all have you know, Native American ancestry and how that happened. And then, of course, the white um, colonizers. She integrates who they are where they still are now, how somehow or another we still interact with each other in this little small town, 
et cetera, et cetera. And so in so telling the story, the quote unquote violence, the tri definite trauma of all of these women, um, and you're talking about six generations of women and how they are treated um, by men, how they are treated within the family, what you're speaking of, the colorism, the classism, you know, the expectations, um, her fair-skinned grandmother definitely right. had some uh, prejudices um, against the children. Right. Uh, one of the sisters ends up on drugs. And so she does a really neat job of wrapping all of that into a very cogent story. Um, so Dr. Kemp, in terms of uh, black people being defined as Cain, can you speak a little bit about, um, you know, then extending that to our internal lives? Sure, certainly. I mean, I think two things came to mind in that. Number one, how often do we think of ourselves and others who look like us as being dangerous or depraved? Right, just you know, little things. You go out here, walk ten minutes, and when a, a brother walks past you in the street, do you immediately do you feel your heart rate quicken? Do your palms get a little sweaty? Well, you're assuming because that person walks by you, they must be a thug, right? So, to what degrees have we internalized that lie about what blackness is become a stereotype about how we treat others? So, I think that's one of the main battlefronts for, for us is how do we think about the ways in which we have internalized those three Ds. Um, there's a scholar, uh, George Yancey, who talks about the socio-ontological effect of race. And so going back to what you mentioned, Dr. Burton, about race not being a real thing, but racism has real consequences. And so how do we then become our own worst enemy? You know, like, quick five second story. One of our nephews was staying with us and had a horrible incident at his school. And the person was trying to explain to them, well, it happened to you because you were black. That's a lie. It didn't happen to you because you were black. It happened to you because that person was racist and said your blackness warranted certain treatment. So just the little language we use, right? You weren't called outside of your name because you were black. You were called outside of your name because of racism. So don't own other sins, is what I would say. That's a takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Burton? Uh, yeah, I, can, uh, I don't want to go on too long, but you know, my generation uh, was part of the one uh, that uh, Dr. Baldwin was speaking about. And I wrote about, uh, in my father's house are many mansions on Edgefield County as a case study, uh, the black and white family. And it, it plays back with the intersectionality again because it was sort of fascinating, uh, the idea that was popularized by Moynihan, but actually goes back to the black scholar, uh, uh, E. Franklin Frazier, even W. E. Du Bois, who as great a sociologist was, I tried to explain that it is the evidence he gathered that led him to make these arguments as well, that the African-American women headed the black family and because of slavery. Well, about the time that a group of mainly, though there were, as you mentioned, certainly John Blassingame uh, and others who were black scholars, <laughs> us white scholars were sort of debunking the myth of the black, showing just how strong the black family was against all odds, not that it was easy and everything, it was about the time Ms. Magazine came out with Cecily Tyson on the cover about the strong black woman. And I've always thought that was sort of a metaphor of the gender dynamics and how particularly black women to protect black men uh, in situations, how that had worked out. So I, there's a little bit of that in the essay to explain uh, some of these dynamics, I think. And you're absolutely right of calling out that it is racism, not because that you are black or African American. And I think of when I was University of Illinois, I, I had uh, a number of African-American graduate students had one who wanted to study. This has changed, I think, thanks to work of your dad and others. But one who wanted to study slavery 
and the other six African-American graduate students really attacked him. Why would you want to study slavery? You should be studying the civil rights movement and the things that we did, you know, uh, uh, the positive things. And yet this study of slavery is important. Uh, the survival, not only the brutality, which is there, of course, but the way that a community was created within that and able to survive and come out with this culture that you're so right about and things. So those, I think, might speak a little bit to the question you're asking in the historiographical essay. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm wondering if we uh, might think dialectically about some of these matters. I've heard that it's not because of blackness, but because of racism. Uh, that's an either or approach to reasoning about this matter. Uh, it's, it's because you're black also. Uh, that's my way of thinking about it. When we think dialectically, it's not only because of the racism, it's because you are black. And, and I think we need to take this both and approach to reasoning as opposed to an either or. That's my way of looking at it. I understand. Um, Dr. Crowley, did you want to comment on the yes, internal I'm, relation? Yes, I want to just briefly, um, um, well, I had set up this idea responding to Professor Kemp's idea. <laughs> And now you've presented this, so I'm going to try and mix the two together. Um, but going back to Dr. Kemp's uh, statement, I find the same thing happening in black churches, of us perpetuating the same oppressive measures that were placed against us as black people uh, on each other. Uh, and I see this in the idea that the way that we respond to gender-based violence often is, well, she came to church dressed inappropriately or the skirt wasn't long enough, <clears throat> instead of talking about the sort of s culture that, that creates space for black men to be predatorial and for that to be sanctioned and that that responsibility then falls on the female to present themselves a certain way. Uh, it, and that becomes another element of control like I was talking about. That's puritanicalism. We're talking about the resistance of trying to have conversations around sex and sexuality. Um, con trying to control how a person expresses themselves. Maybe, maybe what you perceive to be sexualized, a sexualized presentation is not what it is, but it is the sort of culture that we are in that supports that very toxic and oppressive way of handling the bodies of our own community members. Besides myself? Oh, no. <laughs> Mr. Quick. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm curious because um, we're starting a project with Stacey Floyd Thomas around the divide between the black church and the academy. And I've been here a good portion of the day uh, struggling linguistic mechanisms, uh, what could be the perception of hostility? Uh, how do we uh, deal with what may be rooted in a certain classism? The, the, the information here is incredibly needed, not just to educate our churches, but our communities. Unfortunately, one of the largest repositories of education in our community are our churches. I'm struggling with how do we, A, identify on both ends, which may be um, an unspoken classism in which our academics are separated from ground level conversation. I, I had this debate So much of our black intellectual giftedness are at predominantly white institutions that will charge churches $20,000 to give a speech. And, and so, so much of the importance of this is separated space. 
from where the bulk of our community exists every week. But we need this conversation. We need the conversation on gender violence. We need the conversation on sexuality. We, we need the conversation on all of these things. I, I, I grow frustrated because it's in such segmented spaces. So I'm curious with the panelists, how do they see bridging gaps and creating spaces where the masses of our community that will never walk on Morehouse's campus or on any educational institution but need to hear this because our churches are the first line of interacting with girls who are sexually abused or young, I'm a survivor of sexual molestation but we need to equip pastors with open to these conversations, but how do we create those spaces? And I, I really appreciated Dr. Uh, Crawley's conversation around non-connectionalism in black churches, which also goes back to the fact that the lack of connectionalism is also connected to the lack of continual education. And I'll close my question with, should we revisit the crisis of the Negro intellect? start reading Harold Cruz and understanding what the role of the black intellectual is in our community. And is that role being fulfilled or has our professionalism of the academy forced us to leave ground level institutions? Four twenty. Some ways in which we extend this discussion. Um, of course, we have this histori historiography of slavery um, I feel like um, also of our interpretation of religion. Um, do you have comments about where that, inf where you might share that information, where you think these ideas, even in this particular book, um, might be shared more widely? Because that person who's not from the campus, we might look at them and say, and then we're otherizing them. Like, how do we democratize the kind of conversation that we're having? Well, I'll say as a junior scholar, uh, junior scholar who's just getting started, and I'll pass it over to the ones who can speak more long. I thank you so much for, <laughs> thank you for your comments about the professionalism of the academy. Um, I'll just speak just sort of from my experience. So um, the a book that I've written, although it is an academic manuscript, is all about uh, lived experiences and conversations that have taken place within black churches. So I researched all of the historically black churches uh, across the United States that have gone through a queering process and done the sorts of things that I've been speaking about. <clears throat> um, sadly, um, I've been told over and over again that I'm never going to get a job, I'm never going to get tenure because I'm writing to the church from the academy and that I need to be writing to the academy and just talking about religion and not talking about the church. Um, so um, I have a church that supports what I'm doing. So I'm just going to keep on writing to who the Lord is telling me to write to uh, and hope that the Lord will make a way somehow and I'll be able to teach somewhere and get out of this lectureship that I've been in forever. Um, so I appreciate you for saying that because my conversations are happening on the ground level with churches. I'm often having a hard time really being respected by intellectuals as really doing intellectual work. You know, I, I went through this wrestling with Oxford Press and trying to figure out, you know, well, who's this book written to? You know, how are we, well, it needs to meet these aims. And then we also have this burden of trying to get tenure as well. So there, there are, it's many layers to this. Uh, and I agree, we should uh, revisit uh, Cruz's work, but I mean, we also have, Dr. Warnock's work, The Divided Mind of the Black Church, I mean, there's divisions all over the place. And there's a, there's a lot of diversity out there. Um, in my work, I try to highlight the fact that um, my colleagues always try to act as if this work is not happening. But I'm finding it all over the place. I'm having conversations with all types of people. Uh, Don Abram, 
who spoke earlier today with his new initiative, uh, Pride in the Pews. He was uh, one of my students in my Thinking Theologically About Ministry class at Harvard, um, the section. And he's doing that work with churches uh, throughout the United States. So I, I think the work is happening. I, I just think it's probably so a few of us who are trying to do it and we're overwhelmed and we're trying to get it all done. Um, I'd love to be able to come and have some conversations uh, with, with, with any communities that you know about. You want to speak? Yes. Uh, as far back as James Cone, and many of you know the writings of James Cone, who was uh, one of the black theologians who passed away in 2018, he addressed that chasm between what black theologians are writing and where black church people are in terms of their belief systems and their values and so forth. There's always been that chasm, and there's still that chasm. Black theologians are writing one thing, and black church people uh, are preaching and, and talking about something else. But there's also the problem of what Cornel West calls the dilemma of the black intellectual. That is, that we're not accepted in the black community or the white community. There's that struggle to be accepted uh, because, you know, people don't feel that uh, what we are saying applies to them or that they can make sense of what we are saying. So you have this, this problem also. Okay, and the, is my mic on? Is that the, the, hello. Okay, so here's the game plan. Looks like several, maybe three more people are interested in asking a question. Can we hear those questions? And then we can promote just some discussion among the panel about the things that have been said. And then after that, Dr. Amos Brown will give us a last word. Okay, and announcements about tomorrow. Oh, and Dean Carter will give us some announcements about tomorrow. So, yes. So, hello everyone. Um, I wonder if the, the tag is what actually brings us into the realm of us who are in black churches and majority settings or majority denominations. Um, we are being pushed on. Thank you. You, sir?
said about criminal. This thing about abortion, about reverence for life, there's no reverence for life. It's a numbers game, y'all. And still, there is the desire to keep white authority. Read it. But what we still got to do is go back, turning to ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So it sounds like apathy and gentrification, essentially. Um, do you have ideas about how we motivate? And please. I'm going to say this. I mean, I know we're in, I know that the audience is primarily uh, composed of theologians and persons affiliated with the church. But the people we're trying to reach are not in the church anymore. <laughs> I mean, that's just flat out the truth. And I saw it years ago when I was working um, in the city of Atlanta in the mayor's office. It used to be a time you could go to a particular neighborhood or particular churches and get the message out. That day is over. And those kids that were out in the street that I was re referencing, they are not in the church for the most part. 
All right. There are a lot of them. I, I'm not going to say they're not in college. They are getting some type of education. They're interested in advancing themselves. The churches that do well, those mega churches, the reason they do well is because they're giving them something they want. And that is a way to survive in America, whatever that survival might be. Of course, yes, there are still those discriminatory practices, even in those mega churches. So I'm not giving them a pass. But um, you've got to get out there where they are. And you know, the church is, it, the church does not have to be a building. You all know that. It does not have to be a building. It can be at the skating rink. It can be uh, in the beauty parlors, the barber shops, but you've got to get the message out. And you've got to get the message out to help them do discernment about morality because right to now, our black churches or our black evangelicals are turning towards the Republican Party because they are concerned about abortion rights and they, they want to be concerned, they, they're concerned about what they can, what, what is Christianity. So you've got to broaden, as we've done in this discussion, but this is an ivory tower discussion, you know. Uh, that people need to understand that you can be a Christian and that you can be open-minded, that you can be accepted, accepting, and that you can be democratic in more ways than one. And, um, but you've, you've got to get outside of the church, I'm sorry. And everybody's saying how to do it. Well, you know, already you're doing it with social media, uh, but you got to get out there where the people are, that's all I can say. I mean, I'm not a politician like you, Adrian. But, well, I'm saying I don't understand political science. Like. I will not be running for anyone's office. Dr. Baldwin. Yes, I, I think we're talking about really a titanic ideological struggle. Uh, that's actually what it is to, to regain, to, to bring people in the church who, uh, young, especially young people who, not only don't go to church, uh, many, many of them don't have a problem breaking in the church <laughs> and, and stealing instruments. So I think part of the problem, I think, involves coming up with a different language. You can no longer say, get saved. Mm. You need to get saved. Uh, we need to come up with a different way of speaking to young people. That kind of language no longer works. And, and I think that's, that's important as well. Thank you. Um, you know, the hour grows late. Dean Carter is right behind me now, so that I know that my time here is up. <laughs> um, I really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation uh, with our writer speakers. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jones. Dr. Dante, quick, stand up. This is our preacher tomorrow morning, and I want you to make an extra effort to hear him. He has a most unusual sermon topic. It is, a house is not a home, colon. A Solomonic Phenomenology. Bring your dictionaries. <laughs> Just a few announcements, and then I want to make one suggestion that I made earlier. All platform guests are to be Come through my office, the Chapel Library, at 1015, and have your regalia or your religious vestments, and you'll be instructed where to go. All inductees into the Board of Preachers, Board of Sponsors, and the Collegium of Scholars, you are to be in this room at 9 o'clock in this space. This will be the first time we're coming up here for this, but your number is the largest we've ever had. 
because we're combining two classes because of the pandemic. I also want to announce that at 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon to 6.30, the Reverend Professor Kenyatta R. Gilbert from Howard University, Professor of Homiletics, will be in a dialogue dinner with our chapel assistants and other guests, and he'll be speaking from the topic Exodus Preaching, Confronting Human Tragedy and Communal Despair. Some of your questions will probably be addressed by him. One response that we have tried here for 43 years to the question asked by Dr. Quick is that every Sunday after our Vesper hour, we have sermon talkbacks. They're not popular in churches. And unfortunately, as I have said many places, churches specialize in structural violence. Structural violence is one-way communication. If we had more dialogical invitations to the congregation to talk back after having listened to the preacher talk only to the congregation, maybe some of these issues might come up. I get the impression there's a lot of insecurity in the clergy as to why this is not a popular idea. <laughs> I don't know whether that's an indictment on the theological education or not. Finally, I think we need to get out of giving the larger social order an additional reason not to be responsible. In my opinion, it's not African slavery. It's American slavery of African people. That's kind of subtle. But it seems to give an excuse to the white supremacists, another reason for them not to be responsible. President Trump announced during the pandemic to the nation and the world that he was not responsible. He forgot one thing about ethics. Responsibility checks freedom all over the world. You are not fit to participate in civilization if you're not willing to be accountable. That's enough said about that. I am delighted that you came this evening. You've made us look more successful than we are. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. It'll be a long day. And don't forget, the grand finale will be the chance to hear our theme addressed by the Reverend Al Sharpton. And he will be here. He's very excited. His oral portrait is over there. Uh, it has been unveiled before, but it has been redone. If you speak to me privately, I'll tell you why. <laughs> but 
you know, things happen. Stuff happens. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>